The United States' westward expansion in the 19th century had a profound and often devastating impact on Native American communities, including the Navajo people. This expansion was driven by various factors, including a desire for new land, access to valuable resources, and the belief in manifest destiny. The idea that it was the nation's destiny to expand across the continent. As settlers moved westward, their encroachment on traditional native lands led to conflicts and challenges for indigenous communities. The Navajo tribe found themselves at the center of this historic oppression by the United States, since they happened to be one of those tribes who lived on or along the territories the nation wanted to own. For the Navajo people, westward expansion meant disrupting their traditional way of life. They had long occupied a vast region in the southwestern United States, but as American settlers arrived, they faced increasing pressure to relocate to reservations. The forced removal of the Navajo, often referred to as the Long Walk, resulted in the displacement of thousands and the loss of their ancestral lands. This traumatic event had profound cultural, social, and economic consequences for the Navajo, as they struggled to adopt the reservation system and a more sedentary lifestyle. Welcome to a new episode of the Native Journals. In today's edition, we explore the history of a Native American tribe, the Navajo people, and the effect of their forceful exit from their ancient land on their once rich and established culture and society. Before we continue with the story, please like the video and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on more exciting narratives like this one. The Navajo, spelled Navajo, are a Native American people of the southwestern United States. The Navajo recount the tale of the emergence, a narrative in which first man, first woman, and their people journeyed from the first world to the fourth world, also known as the Earth surface world. During this migration, first man transported four sacred mountains from the third world to the Earth surface world. These mountains, namely Cisna Gini, White Mountain, also recognized as Blanca Peak in Colorado, Tsudzu, Turquoise Mountain, identified as Mount Taylor in New Mexico, Duco Uswid, Yellow Mountain, known as Mount Humphreys in Arizona, and Dibe Netsa, Dark Mountain, recognized as Hesperus Peak in Colorado, serve as sacred landmarks denoting the ancestral homeland of the Navajo people. According to anthropological theories, it is believed that the Navajo diverged from the southern Athabascans and migrated into the southwest region sometime between 200 and 1300 AD. They communicate using a southern Athabascan language known as Dine Bizayad, which translates to people's language in their tongue. The Navajo people identify as the Diné, signifying the people. This language encompasses two regional dialects that are mutually understandable. The Apache languages share close linguistic ties with the Navajo language, as both the Navajo and Apaches originated from northwestern Canada and eastern Alaska, where most Athabascan speakers reside. In addition to Diné Bizaad, some Navajo are proficient in Navajo Sign Language, considered a dialect or an offshoot of plain sign talk. From 900 to 1525 AD, the Navajo people cultivated a culturally intricate and thriving society in northwestern New Mexico. In the traditional attire of Navajo women, they dress in foot or knee-high moccasins, along with a pleated velvet or cotton skirt that matches a long sleeve blouse. They often accessorize with concho and sash belts, various pieces of jewelry, and a shawl. Similarly, Navajo men also incorporate jewelry and moccasins into their attire, complemented by a preference for velveteen shirts. Traditionally, the Navajo society has adhered to a matrilineal structure, wherein the women's family owned various assets, including livestock, residences, agricultural lands, and grazing territories. Following marriage, a Navajo man typically adopted a matrilocal living arrangement, residing with his bride in her dwelling and near her maternal family. The transmission of generational property inheritance was usually vested in daughters or, when necessary, other female relatives. In cases of marital separation, it was customary for women to retain control over property and custody of children. These children were considered born to and affiliated with the mother's clan while they were born for the father's clan. The maternal eldest brother played a substantial role in the upbringing of her children. In their adult years, men served as representatives of their mother's clan in tribal political matters. 
The Navajo religion is widely practiced and known for its intricate nature. It encompasses many traditions that delve into various aspects of their belief system. Some traditions recount the emergence of the first people from different worlds concealed beneath the Earth's surface, while others elucidate the origins and significance of numerous rituals and ceremonies. Among these customs, some are uncomplicated rituals conducted by individuals or families to secure good fortune in travel and trade, or to safeguard their crops and herds. On the other hand, more elaborate rites require the involvement of a specialist whose compensation is determined by the intricacy and duration of the ceremony. Traditionally, many of these rituals primarily aim to heal physical and mental ailments. In certain traditions, the Navajo would pray, sing, and create dry paintings using pollen and flower petals. These customs sometimes evolved into public events, featuring dances and exhibitions, drawing together hundreds or thousands of Navajo individuals. Remarkably, many of these rites continue to be practiced today. Navajo engagements with Spain can be traced back to at least the 17th century, a period marked by the arrival of refugees from certain Rio Grande pueblos who sought shelter among the Navajo following the Spanish suppression of the Pueblo Revolt. Moving into the 18th century, some members of the Hopi tribe departed from their mesas due to severe drought and famine conditions, finding refuge and forming connections with the Navajo, notably in the region of Canyon de Chelly in northeastern Arizona. In the early stages, the Navajo primarily relied on hunting and gathering for sustenance. However, as time progressed, they acquired agricultural knowledge from the Pueblo peoples, focusing on cultivating the traditional Native American trio known as the Three Sisters, comprising corn, beans, and squash. Additionally, the Navajo adopted the practice of herding sheep and goats from the Spaniards, which became a vital source of trade and sustenance. Including meat in their diet became indispensable, and sheep became a form of currency and a symbol of family status. With the guidance of the Pueblo Indians, Navajo women began the art of spinning and weaving wool into blankets and clothing. This skill not only allowed them to create items of significant artistic expression, but also opened up opportunities for trade and commerce as these products gained value and recognition in the broader market. During this period, the Navajo established trade connections with the Anasazi and the historical Pueblo peoples. The trade between the Navajo people and the Pueblo brought fresh commodities and technologies, including flint points and moccasins, to the southwestern region. As early as 1620, the Navajo might have started their migration into southeastern Utah, and by the 18th century, they had extended their presence into northeastern Arizona and southeastern Utah. Oral history reveals a complex relationship between the Navajo and the Pueblo people, characterized by cooperation and tension. There is evidence of a willingness among the Navajo to integrate Puebloan concepts and practices into their traditions. Trade between the two groups had been established for a considerable period, but ongoing conflicts often marred it. These conflicts prompted the Pueblo people to make adjustments, such as modifying ceremonial schedules to avoid Navajo raids and limiting the sharing of information about their customs and symbols. Spanish records from the mid-16th century document trade interactions between the Pueblo people and the Navajo. The Puebloans exchanged maize and woven cotton goods in return for bison meat, hides, and stones from the Athabascans, who were either passing through the Pueblo's territory or settling in nearby areas. By the 18th century, Spanish reports indicated that the Navajo had expanded their economic activity significantly. They were described as maintaining substantial livestock herds and cultivating extensive crop fields. According to Western historians, the Spanish referred to the Navajo people as Apaches or Quechos before 1600. Geronimo de Zarate Salmeron, who was present in Jemez in 1622, used the term Apache de Navajo during the 1620s to denote the inhabitants of the Chama Valley region. This region was situated east of the San Juan River and northwest of what is now Santa Fe, New Mexico. The precise moment when the Navajo people started to distinguish themselves more clearly from their Apache relatives remains unclear based on Navajo sources. The term Navajo itself has its origins in the Tiwa language. However, by the 1640s, the Spanish had started using the word Navajo to refer to the Diné people specifically. 
In the 1670s, Spanish records documented that the Diné people resided in an area they referred to as Dineta, which was situated approximately 60 miles, or 97 kilometer, to the west of the Rio Chama Valley region. By the 1770s, Spanish authorities organized military expeditions aimed at the Navajo population in Mount Taylor and the Chusca Mountains in New Mexico. Throughout this period, there existed a dynamic and occasionally shifting relationship between the Spanish, Navajos, and the Hopis, a Pueblo people. They engaged in trade and sporadically formed loose alliances, which varied over time, to confront Apache and Comanche groups. These alliances were primarily forged for defense. However, it's important to note that during this era, there were sporadic minor raids conducted by Navajo bands against Spanish settlers, and vice versa. Mexico asserted its independence from Spain, as documented in the Treaty of Cordova dated August 24, 1821, and the Proclamation of Mexican Independence on September 28, 1821. The capital remained situated in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The Navajo people found themselves in a contentious relationship with the Mexicans, predominantly of mixed Spanish and indigenous ancestry. Accounts from Spanish and American sources tell of disturbing incidents, such as the killing of peaceful Navajo traders by Mexicans, or the slaughter of innocent Mexican traders by the Navajo. Regardless of the circumstances, a cycle of retaliation was deemed necessary, either to appropriate what had been left behind, or to seek vengeance for the murders. Navajo attacks compelled the Mexicans to abandon several cities, leading to a consensus that the Navajo were more formidable warriors than their Mexican counterparts. Some American officers, like Eaton in 1854, contended that the Navajo were not inherently skilled warriors, but appeared so, because the Mexicans were perceived as cowardly. The Mexicans derogatorily referred to the Navajo as their slaves, and asserted that the Navajo provided them with skilled weavers, whom they could sell to the Spanish at high prices. Although the Navajo appropriated Mexican sheep, they refrained from destruction, explaining that they wished to leave a few as shepherds to help raise more flocks for the Navajo people. The Navajo people first encountered the United States Army on June 21, 1846, when the Army of the West, composed of 1,148 soldiers under the leadership of Colonel Stephen Watts Kearney, assembled at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. This force consisted of both regular troops and volunteers. Departing from Fort Leavenworth that day, their destination was Santa Fe. In an incident that transpired without violence, New Mexico, then under Mexican control, came under the authority of the United States. Among the notable figures in this army were Colonel Alexander William Donovan and Major Edward Vos Sumner, who would later play significant roles in shaping the fate of the Navajo people. An essential moment in this interaction occurred on November 21, 1846. Captain John Reed, leading a small group of American soldiers, ventured deep into Navajo territory and extended an invitation to negotiate a peace treaty. Navajo leader Narbona and others engaged in discussions with Colonel Alexander Donovan at Bear Springs, Ojo del Oso, later the site of Fort Wingate. Regrettably, this agreement was not honored by some members of the Navajo community, nor by certain New Mexicans. Subsequently, hostilities ensued, with the Navajos launching raids on New Mexican livestock, while New Mexicans retaliated by capturing Navajo women, children, and livestock. In 1849, Colonel John McRae Washington, the military governor of New Mexico, and Indian agent John S. Calhoun, led a contingent of 400 soldiers into Navajo territory, including the deep reaches of Canyon de Chelly. In this endeavor, they negotiated with two Navajo leaders, Mariano Martinez as head chief and Chapiton as second chief. The resulting treaty officially recognized the transfer of jurisdiction from the United Mexican States to the United States. Under the terms of this treaty, it was agreed that forts and trading posts could be established on Navajo land. In return, the United States pledged to provide such donations and other liberal and humane measures as it may deem fit and proper. Regrettably, on the way to signing this treaty, the highly influential Navajo peace advocate Narbona met a tragic end. This event exacerbated tensions between the parties involved in the treaty negotiations. Over the subsequent decade, the United States proceeded to establish military forts 
within the traditional lands of the Navajo people. Official military records of the time characterize this development as a precautionary measure to safeguard U.S. citizens and the Navajo population from potential conflicts. However, the historical pattern of raids and expeditions, reminiscent of the Spanish-Mexican Navajo interactions, persisted in 1860-61. Despite the opposition of the territorial governor, a campaign was conducted by over 400 New Mexican militia against the Navajo. This campaign resulted in the loss of Navajo warriors, the capture of women and children for enslavement, and the destruction of crops and dwellings. Within Navajo historical accounts, this period is referred to as Nahon Zud, which translates to the fearing time. In 1861, Brigadier General James H. Carleton, who commanded the Federal District of New Mexico, launched a series of military operations against the Navajos and Apaches. Colonel Kit Carson, stationed at the newly established Fort Wingate with Army troops and New Mexico militia volunteers, received orders from Carleton to eliminate Mescalero Apache men and destroy any Mescalero property they could find. Carleton believed employing such severe tactics would bring any Indian tribe under control. Consequently, the Mescalero surrendered and were relocated to a newly designated reservation called Bosque Redondo. In 1863, Carleton directed Carson to employ similar methods against the Navajo. Carson and his forces traversed Navajo territory, resulting in the loss of Navajo lives, destruction of crops and homes, contamination of wells, and confiscation of livestock. Confronted with the dire prospect of starvation and peril, various Navajo groups sought refuge at Fort Defiance. On July 20, 1863, the first of several groups began their journey to join the Mescalero at Bosque Redondo, with additional groups continuing to arrive throughout 1864. The agonizing and tragic journey of the Navajo people to Bosque Redondo is a harrowing chapter in Native American history. This walk is known as the Long Walk due to the length of the distance covered by the people. Around 900 men, women, children, elderly, nursing mothers, and pregnant mothers were forced to march 300 miles from their ancestral land in Arizona and New Mexico to a lonely and unfamiliar place called Bosque Redondo, a barren reservation in eastern New Mexico. The journey was marked by extreme hardships, with inadequate food, harsh weather conditions, and disease taking a heavy toll on the Navajo people, especially the elderly, women, and children. At Bosque Redondo, the Navajo were subjected to squalid living conditions, further exacerbating their suffering. The promised provisions and protection did not materialize as expected. Disease, malnutrition, and despair ran rampant in the internment camps, leading to immense grief and loss of life. The walk lasted for several years, during which the Navajo endured immeasurable pain and loss. However, despite their adversity, the Navajo people persevered, maintaining their cultural identity and resilience. In 1868, after years of negotiations and advocacy, the Navajo Nation signed a treaty with the U.S. government, the Treaty of Bosque Redondo, which allowed them to return to their homeland. The long walk remains a testament to the endurance and strength of the Navajo people in the face of immense suffering and adversity. Following the Long Walk, the United States military maintained a presence on the Navajo Reservation. From 1873 to 1895, they enlisted Navajos as Indian scouts at Fort Wingate to assist their regular units. During this time, Chief Manuelito established the Navajo Tribal Police, operating from 1872 to 1875 as an anti-raid force to uphold the peaceful terms of the 1868 Navajo Treaty. According to the treaty, Navajos were allowed to leave the reservation for trade with military or local Indian agent permission. This arrangement gradually reduced Navajo raids as the tribe expanded their livestock and crop production. Additionally, the Navajo reservation size increased significantly, from 3.5 million acres to its present 16 million acres. However, Economic conflicts persisted as non-Navajo individuals and companies exploited Navajo resources. The U.S. government leased land for livestock grazing, took land for railroad development, and permitted mining on Navajo territory without consulting the tribe. During their time on the reservation, 
The Navajo people were subjected to efforts of assimilation into white society. One prominent aspect of this was the compulsory education of Navajo children in boarding schools, both on and off the reservation. The first Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA school, was established at Fort Defiance in 1870, subsequently paving the way for the founding of eight additional schools. However, many older Navajo individuals vehemently opposed this education and resorted to hiding their children to prevent their enrollment. Once Navajo children arrived at these boarding schools, their lives underwent profound changes. European American instructors delivered classes exclusively in English and punished any student caught speaking Navajo. The students lived under a strict militaristic regime overseen by individuals called the Silao. Numerous accounts recount instances of capture and discipline by the Silao for those attempting to escape. Conditions within these schools were challenging, characterized by inadequate food, overcrowding, compulsory manual labor in various capacities such as kitchens, fields, and boiler rooms, and the enforcement of military-style uniforms and haircuts. Substantial change within these boarding schools did not occur until after the publication of the Merriam Report in 1929 by the Secretary of the Interior, Hubert Work. This report shed light on the inadequacies of Indian boarding schools, including diet, medical services, dormitory overcrowding, underqualified educators, excessively harsh disciplinary practices, and the requirement for students to engage in manual labor to sustain the school's operations. During World War II, young Navajo individuals relocated to urban areas to contribute to the war effort by working in factories. Many Navajo men, inspired by their warrior culture, voluntarily enlisted in the military and served in integrated units. In 1940, the War Department rejected a proposal from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to create segregated units for Native Americans. This decision provided the Navajo people with a first-hand opportunity to observe how they could assimilate into the modern world, leading to many not returning to crowded reservations where employment opportunities were scarce. A significant chapter in Navajo history during this period involved the heroic efforts of 400 Navajo code talkers. They played a renowned role in World War II by transmitting radio messages in their native language, which the Japanese could not comprehend or decode. The Navajo code talkers profoundly impacted the history of the United States Marine Corps. They harnessed their native language to create a military code, with words like turtle, representing tanks for instance. In 1942, Marine staff officers devised combat simulations, which the Navajo code talkers translated and transmitted in their language to a fellow Navajo on the other end of the line. Remarkably, this Navajo could retranslate it into English faster than any other cryptographic facility showcasing their effectiveness. Consequently, General Vogel recommended their recruitment into the USMC code talker program. Each Navajo code talker underwent basic training at the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego before moving on to Field Signal Battalion training at Camp Pendleton. Following their training in the United States, these code talkers were deployed to the Pacific and assigned to Marine Combat Divisions. Notably, the Navajo language remained unbroken and undecipherable throughout their service. Many Navajos volunteered to become code talkers, but due to limitations, not all could be accepted. Nonetheless, an undisclosed number of other Navajos served as Marines during the war, albeit not as code talkers. The achievements of the Navajo code talkers have left an indelible and honorable mark on the history of the United States Marine Corps. Their unwavering patriotism and commitment earned them the respect and admiration of all Americans. As of 2021, the Navajo Nation boasts over 309,994 enrolled tribal members, making it the largest federally recognized tribe in the United States. Furthermore, the Navajo Nation's reservation, the largest in the nation, extends across the Four Corners region and encompasses over 27,325 square miles, 70,000 square claw, of land spanning Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. Notably, the Navajo reservation is slightly larger than the state of West Virginia. The Navajo language is prevalent across the region and most Navajo individuals are proficient in English. And that is all for today's video. Thank you for watching till this point. Again, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel so you get notified each time we upload a new video like this one.